Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, and uh, Happy Christmas. Um, I wanted to revisit the puzzle that Mark solved yesterday on Christmas Day uh, on the channel, which was last Friday's diabolical Sudoku from the Daily Telegraph. Um, Mark showed you one way of, of solving the puzzle, and it was very much in the sort of mode that he uses when solving Sudoku. So, I mean, for those of you who haven't watched his video, or or indeed for those of you who have, you would have found he's very self-deprecating about his ability uh, in terms of the advanced techniques. He, you know, he is built for speed in, in essence and is very much solving to a method that gets to the answer as quickly as possible. And if that means he needs to uh, bifurcate um, or I suppose uh, less euphemistically one might say guess to arrive at a correct solution then he will. And he showed yesterday how by selecting an appropriate point to bifurcate, uh, he was able to crack the puzzle very, very efficiently. Now, some of us are, I think, you know, less likely to be uh, in the game just for speed. Um, I have competed myself in the speed Sudoku championships in the past, um, not as successfully as Mark. I mean, he's a phenomenal Sudoku solver. So I'd say take his self-deprecation with a little bit of uh, a pinch of salt because we can all learn something from uh, his ability and his skills. Um, but for myself, I tend to be uh, slightly slower and I, I enjoy some of the more, I suppose, mathematical and deeper logic that you can find in the cross uh, in the Sudokus, uh, slip of the tongue there. And, um, and I want to take a look at this puzzle and see if we can see a way of making progress without bifurcation. Um, and I know a couple of you who commented on Mark's video were hoping that we would be able to do that. So let's have a look. Um, well, there, there is one point, I think, straight away that I can see a way of making some progress with the puzzle. So this is the point at which Mark bifurcated by, uh, I think he looked along these three cells here and noticed these could be one of two possibilities and, and went from there. Um, now, if we look at these two cells though, you can see in this 3x3 three three block we are missing the numbers uh, 2, 5 and 7. So let's just put those in and have a think about what that means. And something should be jumping out of you, especially if you've watched a few of the videos on the channel where we discuss uniqueness. Um, I hope it's obvious to everybody that if we were to put a 2 into this box such that these two cells were 5 and 7, there would be a huge problem um, because this puzzle is no longer unique in the sense it now has two solutions. Um, now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that whether this number is a 5 or a 7, um, it makes no difference to the rest of the puzzle. Let, let's, let's work it through. If this is a 5, this cell would be a 5, this cell would be a 7, and this cell would be a 7. But if, on the other hand, this was a 7, all that happens is that the other three cells in this two by two arrangement just flip their uh, number to the other number, the other alternative, and the puzzle, nothing else in this puzzle changes. In effect, if we were to arrive at a situation where we had this arrangement of five, seven in the grid in these four squares, this five, seven arrangement forms its own puzzle. We could actually almost remove it from the rest of the Sudoku um, and consider it separately because the, the four cells in question affect no other cell at all. Um, so that might be a way of getting your head around what I mean when I refer to uniqueness. I can literally, in this situation, extract these four cells from the puzzle and it doesn't matter what numbers I put into them, the rest of the puzzle is unaffected um, because however I arrange the fives and sevens in, these, in this two by two uh, set of cells. It does nothing to anything else. So this is where we have to be very, very cautious. If we arrive at this situation, we know it's wrong. We know a good Sudoku puzzle only have one solution. So I know that this cell cannot contain a 2. So we can remove a 2 from this cell. Uh, and then you can see that we have a 2-4 uh, pair in these two cells. So we know that Again, there cannot be a 2 in this cell, so we can remove that. That gives us a 5-7 pair in this 3x3 three three block, which allows us to know that the 2 goes in there. Now, what can we do with that? Well, we can pencil mark some 2s down here, look. 
Um, ah, in fact, this cell, this cell looking at the row, looking at row four, could be one, two, or six. But now we have a one here, two here. So this cell can only be a six. And that means we can we can we can make some pencil marks. Let's do that. Two, two, and make some pencil marks here. And then we get another arrangement of twos that's interesting. If we look at the twos in these two cells and the twos in these two cells, we know now that we have a complete set of twos for columns four and column six, because whether this is a two and this is a two, or this is the two and this is the two, there cannot be any more twos in columns four and six. Hopefully that's clear. That's one of the advantages of using this pencil mark notation, uh, is that this sort of arrangement here uh, just jumps out at you. Whereas, can you imagine if you'd, you know, if we filled in all of the alternatives for these squares, so if we it, it just makes it harder to see. Um, so going down to this three by three block, we now know that there cannot be twos in column four and column six, and that twos must be in one of those two positions. Um, now, now this this is where I think what I would do uh, if I was solving this seriously um, and not for speed is I would think about notating the rest of the cells in this puzzle that could can only contain two digits because I've noticed as I'm sure you have if you've been doing the diabolical Sudoku for a long time that um, if we identify all of the cells that only contain two digits we tend to find things that are interesting um, they are very very fond of sort of forcing chains so let's just have a scan around the grid and see if we can spot likely areas so this cell that can be what, a 1, 2 or a 6, but there's a 2 here. So that cell can be a 1 or a 6. Uh, 1, 2 and 4. Ah, yeah, well Mark looked at the uh, row 8, didn't he? So, and he told us that all of these cells could only be two digits. So let's go along there. 1, 4 here. 1, 2 here. 2, 4 there. Uh, 1, 2, 6. This is a 2 or a 6. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4. 7 down here, 1 and 3, so this is a 2 or a 7, one, two, that, that, one, that one could be more than that, um, 1, 2, this is a 3 or a 7, and let's check this cell here, 1, 4, 7, yes, 1, 7, so this can be 1, 3 or 7 I think. So we've now got let me just stare at this for a second. Three, seven, eight, nine. This is seven or an eight. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, we've got enough. We yes, we have. We've got enough. This is this is enough now. Um, so as suspected, we've now got the chain. Now, wh what do I mean when I say a chain? Well, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to investigate the alternatives if we select a square like this one and we, we, we choose each option and what we'll find very quickly here is that we're able to make some deductions especially in this left hand side of the grid so what do I mean well let's choose a one here what happens if this is a one if this is a one this is a two and this is a four obviously so this will be a one and therefore this cell here will be a 7 and this is the key to spot that this is a 7 so if this is a 1 this is a 7 let's just remember that now let's ask what happens if this is a 6 if this is a 6 this will be a 2 and this will be a 7 so we now have a situation and this is what you're always looking for with these chains where we can force the same number to arrive um, in two different ways. So whether we choose one or six here, we end up with a seven here or a seven here. So then what we can say with certainty is if there is any cell in the grid that can see both this cell and this cell, that cell cannot contain a seven because the seven will be ruled out either by the seven here or the seven here. And you can immediately see this cell is the obvious point at which we could, we can now remove this seven and this is going to be a three. Now I'm hoping that will really help. I can see it's going to help quite quickly. Now we get a three six pair 
into these two cells because of the three here uh, and three here. And that means that this and this will have to be one and seven. And now you can see, hopefully, uh, we can put the one and the twos in there. We could have done that earlier, but now where can we place a seven in this in this three by three block? Given that we know there's a seven in one of these two squares, well, it's only going to be here. Um, so let's put the seven in. You can see that gives me the five, gives me the seven, gives me the seven, gives me the five, and I, I, I'm pretty certain that this is the uh, this puzzle is going to now collapse. Um, so that is how I would have made progress from that point. Um, I would have done something slightly different to Mark, um, but as I say, he's looking at finding the quickest way of doing it. I'm normally, when I'm doing these videos, I'm looking for something a little bit elegant, a little, something that where we can look at it together and say, oh, that's really, uh, you know, it makes us feel like uh, the world's put together in a sane and rational way. So something a bit different. I hope it's useful for those of you who wanted to see a logical way through this diabolical. And we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.